It's me again. How did that gobshite get on the television? It's only been. How many months? How do people do this so often? Uh, anyway, let's talk about Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy is one of the most iconic video game series of all time, spanning multiple consoles, with at least 15 mainline entries to date, as well as numerous spin-offs. Originally released in 1987, wow, remember the 80s? Anyway, it would bring an epic adventure built in turn-based gameplay to people's homes. Sakaguchi had wanted to make a turn-based game, but Square were unsure. Dragon Quest, which released a year before the first Final Fantasy, paved the way for the series. Dragon Quest was a massive success, which in turn convinced Square to go ahead with Final Fantasy. It may look basic now, but at the time it was revolutionary. You created four characters and gave them jobs, before setting out on a quest to break the time loop. Since then, Final Fantasy has built a massive fan base, with some dedicating their whole online persona to the series. Not me though. I'm all about Bubsy 3D. Dear sir, I think you should play Bubsy 3D because it is great. Do -do 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 -do. Play some Bubsy 3D. Play some Bubsy 3D. Bubsy 3D is so great. Play Bubsy 3D! Shut up, Final Fantasy is a series with so many iconic games that people will argue over what the best one is. Some are drawn to the wonderful sprites and tragic world of Final Fantasy VI. Others to the beautiful setting and exciting characters of VII. Even the best villain in the series will change from person to person. Some prefer the nihilistic outlook of Kefka. Others the power-hungry Sephiroth or even the tragic tale of a child of mixed birth who was abused by his religious father and whose only comfort was sacrifice in a religious ceremony to keep a cycle continuing and who never truly recovered from the mental scars enabled by a hypocritical church to further their own goals. One thing people can agree on is that Final Fantasy 2 isn't the best. In fact, some people consider it to be the worst in the whole series and actually often use it as kind of a Bit of a mocking tool to make fun of the games I don't actually like in the game series. <laughs> but anyway, is all this criticism really valid? Well, yes. Okay, there are some valid criticisms of the game, but we have to remember the time it came out at. Production started during the development of the original Final Fantasy and was spearheaded by Sakaguchi. This time the team wanted to try something different, something bold, something bigger, something not seen before. You also have to remember the sequels at this time were sometimes a little bit different from their predecessor. Look at the Super Mario Bros. 2 that we got in the West for example. Or even Zelda 2. These franchises hadn't quite settled into the style we know today. Final Fantasy 2 kept the turn based gameplay of the first game, which you imported in your character's actions before each round. The ATB system the series became known for was still a way away, releasing with Final Fantasy IV on the SNES. The game also featured a more independent story than the original, focusing on unique characters, their backgrounds, and their struggles to fight off an oppressive empire. It's very Star Wars-y. Final Fantasy II's plot is fairly basic today, with the in-game narrative being greatly reduced. Instead, a manga released alongside the game would flesh out the characters more, while also providing a slightly different story to what was seen in-game. The game also introduced keywords. These were phrases that you could learn by talking to characters and when repeated to others, offered new dialogue or advanced the story. It's a feature that hasn't resurfaced since. Its biggest innovation is perhaps its most controversial, its levelling system. It's built around your style of play. So for example, if you wanted to level up your strength, you do more physical attacks. If you want to level up your magic, you just cast spells. And in fact, casting spells over and over again can help to level up each individual spell up to a level of about 16. One other aspect linked to this was hit points. Traditionally, HP would increase as you leveled up with experience through combat, but Final Fantasy II was different. 
Instead, HP would level up depending on your remaining hit points. A good idea in principle, but horribly executed and severely open to abuse. Players could hit themselves to level up health, action cancel to build up magic, and essentially break the game's difficulty curve. Both of these would be fixed in later versions. HP would increase after a certain amount of battles, but you could still increase it by hitting yourself, and action cancel was fixed from the GBA onwards. However, the game's mechanics were still so broken, you essentially needed to focus on three areas. Magic, Evasion, and Teleport. Magic is fairly self-explanatory. A higher stat can lead to higher MP for you to use. Evasion is probably the most broken stat and more worthy than defense. If the enemy can't hit you, they can't hurt you. This was best achieved through equipping shields in both hands and getting to level 16. Then there's Teleport. The most broken spell in the game. It's an instant death spell, level it up high enough and it would hit around 99% of enemies including bosses. Weapons and magic were broken into 16 levels. As you level up you become more proficient with each weapon and unlock more powerful versions of each spell. 16 levels though, it's a lot, so you'll find yourself focusing on only a few throughout your playthrough. It gives you a bit more freedom to craft each character's roles within your party similar to later entries in the series, but it does require commitment. The game's difficulty curve wasn't exactly smooth, and required some level of grinding, even in the easier re-release versions. As the world map was pretty much fully open to explore from the start, it needed to have a way to warn you off from areas you weren't supposed to explore yet. I even put together this handy map of the starting area for you. Look at all that death. However, Brave players could use this to become overpowered early, especially as the fabled Peninsula of Power lay just outside Altair, the first town. To give a bit of background, the Peninsula of Power is a name given to any area where later enemies are fought early game. It originates from the original Final Fantasy. Since the enemies you encountered were based on a grid system, any area that touched a grid shared with an area that wouldn't be explored until much later would have those enemies. It's a great way to level up early. In the original Final Fantasy, it was located north of Provoca, a reasonable ways into the game. Altair, however, is a lot earlier, and it has an area that shares a square with Mysidia, an area you won't visit until much later. It's a great place to power grind, but also a beginner's trap, so beware. This has kind of been fixed in the Pixel Remastered version though. With the world map as open as it is, it also meant you could access spells like Teleport much sooner if you were willing to brave the trek across the land to get them. Sometimes dungeons could be fairly easy, other times the game expected you to grind, and grind hard. It really was a case of the player's decisions heavily impacting the experience. Its equivalent would probably be Final Fantasy VIII's Triple Triad, and how investing in it early pays off massively later. However, there was an issue with the rotating fourth character, when it came to levelling. Throughout your adventure you would have three main characters in your party at all times, Firion, Maria and Guy. At certain stages you'll be joined by a guest fourth character that will only really join you for a dungeon or two. These characters have their own base stats and spells that need to be levelled up. You can do some grinding when they join and it'll increase the three core characters, but any heavy level grinding means you'll focus less on the fourth and they will be underpowered. An example of this from my recent playthrough was I'd overpower the three core characters, but poor Minwu got left behind and I'm not really bothered with him. Also, over 19 hours of grind, come on Dave. This isn't so bad as he'll leave the party soon enough, but if I want to play the bonus dungeon, Soul Reaper, I'm going to have a bad time, as he takes his stats when he leaves the party. As for the dungeons, they're probably the worst in the series. They're long arduous affairs that are riddled with dead end rooms called monster rooms that contain nothing in them but high encounter rates. They're kind of like a grinding spot, but I found that they just disencouraged me from exploring because there's nothing in them. As I've already mentioned, Final Fantasy II also featured a rotating cast of characters the first time in the series. The three main protagonists, Firion, Maria and Guy, would remain in your party at all times, but the fourth slot would change depending on where you were in the story. These characters include Minwu, the White Mage, Joseph, the Solemn Monk, 
Layla, the rebellious pirate, Gordon, the honourable knight, and Ricard, the revenge-driven dragoon. In fact, Ricard was the first high wind in the series. Each character was more fleshed out than the Warriors of Light in the first Final Fantasy, and even the Union Knights that would follow in Final Fantasy III. If you played Final Fantasy IV, you might be familiar with the concept. You never have more than the four party members at one time. Well, Final Fantasy IVs had five party members, well, it's a similar idea. They each have a role to play in the overall narrative, but due to their short time with the party, they could have done with a bit more fleshing out. For example, Joseph's relationship with his daughter and his hatred of Borgen is noted, uh, but a bit more attention could have been made to make it even more memorable. Final Fantasy is known for some of the best music around composed by Nobu Umatsu. He gave us Dancing Mad, One Winged Angel, and The Extreme. Final Fantasy II soundtrack is a little bit more mm, forgettable, let's say. The main theme, The Rebel Army, will stick with you as it's one of the most enduring songs of the series. The rest, especially the dungeon music, eh, not so much. The boss music is probably the weakest of the whole series, being a lot worse than the regular enemy encounter music. It's not that Final Fantasy II soundtrack is terrible. It just doesn't feel like it's the same standard as the rest of the series, a criticism that can be levelled at the game as a whole. It also doesn't help that for many, their first experience of the game will probably be on the PlayStation, PSP or GBA, by which time we'd have some of the best scores in video games, never mind Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy II would not see a Western release until 2003, when it was released alongside Final Fantasy I as part of the Final Fantasy Origins Collection on the PlayStation 1. This game added FMV intros, updated graphics, and fixed many of the bugs that were present in the NES version, although Action Cancel is still there if you want to be a dirty cheating bastard. The other thing it introduced was difficulty select, but Final Fantasy II's was locked until you beat the game the first time. A year later, the Game Boy Advance would release its own version, Dawn of Souls. The graphics were based on the Wondersworn version. It added in new dungeons, with Final Fantasy II getting Soul of Rebirth, but its gameplay was locked to easy mode. In 2007, the PSP would get its own version of Final Fantasy II, with updated graphics, and in 2021, the Pixel Remastered version would be released, giving us pixel perfect graphics, but missing a lot of the features that would have been in Dawn of Souls. So why did it take so long to hit Western shores? Well, there was actually a North American port in the works. Not a European one, no. We were pretty much forgotten until Final Fantasy VII. Or Mystic Quest if you want to be pedantic. The original plan was to translate it and release it with the subtitle Dark Shadow over Palakia. However, with the time it took to translate and the release of the Super Nintendo, it was decided to focus on the more recent release, Final Fantasy IV. Final Fantasy IV will be released in 1991 to critical success both in Japan and North America. In North America, it will be retitled Final Fantasy II, just to avoid confusion at the time. It didn't help later on when it went back and re-released them though. Final Fantasy 2, the actual Final Fantasy 2, is a bit of a strange entry. I remember being excited to play the other Final Fantasies. I started with 7, and then by the time 9 had come around, they had been re releasing the other ones. We got Final Fantasy Origins, Anthology, and Final Fantasy 6 as a standalone, and these were the first time they were released in Europe. I decided to go with the game by advanced version because it was just more accessible at the time compared to the PlayStation 1 version. I started with the first game in the series, excitedly moving from one area to another, struggling to keep my black mage alive because he has no HP. It might not have been as grand a story as his later entries, but it did have a lot of foundations of the series, job classes, crystals, and many of the monsters we've come to love and loathe. 
Final Fantasy 2 was a different story. It starts out with the feat to set up the plot, its combat system isn't exactly welcoming, and there are parts of the game expects you to avoid combat, which absolutely threw me because I just like to fight everything. I just put it down and didn't go back to it. It wouldn't be until Origins when I try it again. Sometime in 2016 I got into my head I wanted to play through all of the Final Fantasy games back to back. As such, I would try to immerse myself in each one, learning its mechanics, breaking down how to progress, and reading as much about the lore as possible. When it came to Final Fantasy 2, I was surprised by how deep the lore was, but disappointed by how it was presented in game. As I've mentioned, FF2 was originally accompanied by a manga. There were some differences in the manga, but it did expand upon some of the events in the game. I didn't get to read the actual manga, but rather the Final Fantasy wiki page, which is uh, well worth checking out. Here I learned more about the Wild Rose Rebellion, the dynamic characters present in the world, and one of the most underrated villains in the whole series, the Emperor, Matthias. Or Matthias, or however you want to pronounce it. The Emperor's name is never referenced in game, he just goes by his title, but he is a foreboding character that overshadows everything. He wants to rule the world, and to do so, unleash the hordes of hell upon it. He's a skilled magic user, especially in thunder magic. He's cold, calculating, and narcissistic. Some of his most memorable moments include the poisoning of the wyverns, which wipes out an entire village, and summoning the flying fortress, the cyclone, that just rips through the world. In fact, some towns are inaccessible once it appears he's done that much damage. Sound familiar? I've always drawn parallels between him and Final Fantasy VI antagonist, Kefka. He really is the centrepiece of the game, which is odd because you don't actually see him until the midway point, but he is such a massive shadow over all of the game. And yet, in a surprise twist, he's killed off. Spoiler alert! This is what makes him really stand out. After his death, he conquers hell and brings pandemonium back into the world. The party must then venture inside, fighting the monsters of hell, in order to stop him destroying the world. The Dawn of Souls release also brought with it a new emperor, the Light Emperor. When Matthias died, his soul was split in two, with one conquering heaven and the other hell. This means that the members of your party who perished in the main game must confront the Light Emperor and put an end to him once and for all. I feel like Final Fantasy 2 is perhaps one of the most underrated games in the series. It tried to push the boundaries for plot against what was currently available at the time and its levelling system was unique to help it stand out. On writing this I actually went back and played Dawn of Souls and I really enjoyed it but I can kind of get why its levelling system can be a chore especially if you have to level up each individual magic or stat. But then again I kind of like that. I would level 16 teleport before I got to Scott's Ring, the first major item in the game. There was one advantage though of excessive grinding. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money I honestly feel like of all the games in the series that could benefit with a 2.5D remake, Final Fantasy 2 is probably the one. Ah, uh, the old 2.5D JRPG. Since the arrival of Octopath Traveler, they've really seen a sort of renaissance. We've got an Octopath Traveler, Triangle Strategy, Live Alive, Live a Live, Live a Live, or however you want to pronounce it. And Dragon Quest 3 is in the works. I think Final Fantasy 2 would be the biggest beneficiary of one in the whole series. Both 3 and 4 have gotten a DS remake, and 5 and 6 really do hold up well today. Final Fantasy 2 could see the improved gameplay with a more balanced leveling system. I've always been reminded of Grandia's system, where base stats are leveled up normally, but weapon stats and magic stats are leveled up through use. Something similar could make Final Fantasy 2 a little bit more accessible. Then there's the story. It has potential, and with a bit more fleshing out, could become one of the most memorable in the entire series. I know I'm probably in the minority here, 
but I do enjoy Final Fantasy 2. I love its quirks, its epic tale, and its memorable characters. I just think it could do with a little bit more love. <laughs> Get out of here, you nosy little pervert, before I slap you silly.